This program is made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Arts. This is The Writing Life. I'm Grace Cavalieri. Today we're talking to Evan Boland, and she is from Ireland. She is one of Ireland's best recognized poets. Her father was a diplomat, her mother was a painter. She was raised in Dublin, New York, and London. And since the 80s, she's been teaching in colleges in Ireland and in America. And we're going to hear from an opening poem from Evan Boland. Secrets. Your coffin was so small. Only I knew it was full of candlewick bedspreads, orange pico tea leaves, sp smoking chimneys over wet peat. That steam rose there from sweet winter herbs and pearl onions and marrow bones, boiling all one afternoon on the oven top in a stock pot. And if I add the bolt of silk you once brought home and rolled out on a table, showing the gloomy color pewter becomes by candlelight, it is because the secret histories of things deserve to linger, to belong again to the coil of your hair I found once as a child dried out by shadows in a shut tight wooden box in which was a mirror with an ornate handle and enameled back, the original mercury amalgam blemishing the glass from which your face disappeared years ago. That's the voice of Ivan Boland and it's from a book that came out in 2007, Domestic Violence. Ivan, um, part of this book has a section which honors your mother in poems. And there is so much um, which tells about your own writing philosophy. I asked a student who had taken a workshop with you, I said, what was the one thing that you brought away from Evan Bolin? She said that the image drives the narrative. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting way of putting it. I mean, I... Um, I, I guess I probably think that Irish poets are often a sort of mixed breed that narrative is mixed with image. Mm. I mean, it's a very strong narrative side of Irish poetry. Mm. And, but of course, image my, is probably important to me because my mother was also a painter. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a way looking at images with no explanation attached to them on canvas. And when you're six or seven and you come up, my mother would be painting uh, a portrait or something. Then you know, the sight of an eyebrow or an eye on a piece of canvas, you know, was just an image without any kind of narrative. If I were to ask you then, uh, just in the first blush of thought about your mother, what is it she left you? Well, in many ways, and not, not maybe unusually in Ireland, she really was a hero of mine. I, I, think, I think it would be hard to put it into words, except she had a lot of Irish people who had come to their lives without a lot of institutions or structures, especially in her case without advantages. She was an orphan and, and a ward of court when she was very young. She had a great belief in the imaginative world and a great belief that it was an honorable and important thing to pursue. And that made me very free when I was young in, in a society which was very utilitarian, like all societies are. She believed in, in somebody being a poet, and that had that great effect on me. Motherhood, your own motherhood, your mother, Mother Ireland, these themes are prevalent in your work. And I would love it if you would read my favorite poem of yours, and it's about the discipline of painting. I believe that's in your collected poems, which are this is your new book, just out, 2008, yes. New Collected Poems. Yes. Um, it's 
It's called The Last Discipline. It's indeed about my mother painting. In the evening, after a whole day at the easel, my mother would put down her brush, pour turpentine into a glass jar, and walk to the table. Then she took a mirror, hand-sized, enameled in green, and turned her back to the canvas, and stood there, and looked in it. It was dusk, the sheets were ghostly, the canvas was almost not there. In the end, all I could see was her hand closed around the handle. All I can see now is her hand, her head. Her back is turned to what she made. The mirror shows her what is over her shoulder. A room in winter, a window with fog outside it, a painting she sees is not finished. A child, her face round with impatience, who will return, who has returned, who only knows now that she has seen the rare and necessary, usually unobservable, last discipline. What do you take from that perspective of looking over her shoulder with a mirror? What does that mean to you as far as poetry goes? I suppose that unswerving attempt to, to look critically at what you've done, to, you know, to see what it is you've made outside the world of instinct. You know, it's, it's a process of taking care and uh, mm -hmm. often a kind of painful process for a, a writer or a painter. And it, it is that last discipline of being willing to reverse it if it's wrong. In your own writing, your form has changed greatly from An Origin of Waters, 67, 60s. I think yeah. that book is uh, your first book, right? Yeah, and well, now there are some collected poems in that. Sure. But when you look back at those poems from 1967 and you look at your one now in 2007, what is the greatest revelation you have about your change of form? It's, I think when you're young, I mean, I published my first book when I was 22, mm -hmm. I think. And, you know, every young poet goes through a phase, though they really don't like to admit it, of writing somebody else's poem. And I lived in a, a very literary city where there was a sort of well-made poem. It was a technically formalist poem. And I learned how to write it. But, you know, fundamentally, if you learn to write someone else's poem, it will end up <laughs> suppressing your own voice. And the thing I think I found was just the simplest thing of finding enough of my own voice to be able to hear it and to change the way I wrote so that I could sort of change the acoustic around my own voice and be able to say what I wanted. And more brilliantly, the intuitive part of your poetry is what is so astonishing, I think moving back and forth across time. I don't know how you teach people that. I'm going to read a very dry statement, but then we're going to comment on it. Boland addresses broad issues of Irish national identity, as well as the specific issues confronting women and mothers in a culture that has traditionally ignored their experience. Now, you've talked about how difficult it was introducing the washing machine or the baby into the poem, but I believe your real domestic image that you've contributed to poetry is that hand on the windowsill. You might be talking about a sweeping philosophical historical moment, then you say, I put my arm on the windowsill. Do you consider that a feminine gesture that has influenced Irish poetry? Well, I don't know that I, I, I consider it that, but I certainly consider it something I did and a lot of people did. And I think there was a difficulty when, when I was younger in thinking of the Irish poem as a flexible poem into which you could put these small gestures. Um, the, I felt that, you know, it was in danger of becoming a, a very sort of um, sacred space in which the, the small gesture, the small moment of life wasn't considered important enough to go. And so some of those gestures were just the gestures I did or I lived or this is how I did them. And putting them into the poem was some kind of act of faith for me, not just in that life, but that the poem could go there and tell that story. And it lives. 
the poem lives because of those gestures. We've learned so much from that. Would you read us another poem? Yes. Um, this is a, a, a poem called Quarantine, and, and in, in many ways, you know, it's, it's exactly about this, but on that broader scale. The, this is a couple who appear in, in a book very briefly called Mishkel Fein, published at the turn of the century, which looks back, was, turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, a man looking back to the villages um, in, in which people were so affected by the famine in 1847, young couple leave the workhouse, go back to the cabin where they lived and are found dead in the morning. But the man has tried to warm her feet mm -hmm. as she died. And the poem was partly a reproach to poetry in general for not including these lives, including the more glamorous things, but not this. Quarantine. In the worst hour of the worst season of the worst year, of a whole people, a man set out from the workhouse with his wife. He was walking, they were both walking north. She was sick with famine fever and could not keep up. He lifted her and put her on his back. He walked like that, west and west and north, until at nightfall, under freezing stars, they arrived. In the morning, they were both found dead of cold, of hunger, of the toxins of a whole history. But her feet were held against his breastbone. The last heat of his flesh was his last gift to her. Let no love poem ever come to this threshold. There is no place here for the inexact praise of the easy graces and sensuality of the body. There is only time for this merciless inventory. Their death together in the winter of 1847. Also what they suffered, how they lived, and what there is between a man and woman, and in which darkness it can best be proved. That is um, one of your, is that one of your favorite poems? Yes. I mean, it's certainly one of the poems that said something I wanted to say. And you have said that the past is not history, and history is not the past. Would you comment on that? Yes, I think, I think it might be. Maybe it's more obvious in a small country. Maybe it was more obvious to me because I was a young woman writing poetry. But there is a rift between the past and history. I mean, history is the official version. And, <laughs> you know, the past is this place of... of you know, much less clear, much less structured, much less apparently sanctioned or important things. But it's really the past where most people's lives take place and, and where they remember them uh, and remember family members and small incidents. It, it's the past, really, that attracted me, not history. But do you think that Ireland, more than any other country, because of its bardic tradition, overlooked the little people even though ev isn't it so in every country that we go for the decorum first or do you think america is quite different that way i think america is a very different country it ireland was a nation before it was a state mm -hmm. and the united states emerged with both together irish literature is the literature of a defeated people and the united states literature is not those things i think really do change things and um in a, in a country like Ireland, Irish history became a very heroic narrative. Mm -hmm. And I was certainly, when I was younger, very suspicious of that. <laughs> you say, um, in An Origin Like Water, you say, you came to know history as a woman, as a poet, when you left the sight of it. You knew the tradition when you were exiled from it. But the life beckoned to the language, and the language followed. And that is the story of your life, right? Have you written your memoirs? Well, it, it, I, I'm not sure there were memoirs. I've certainly written some essays, mm -hmm. yes. I and, um, you know, going over these things and certainly going over them in a, a, a sort of circular way. Uh, I think that's how you try to find your path, you know. When uh, you look, you've been in America, now you're teaching at Stanford, you're director of the creative writing department, you teach Irish literature and poetry, professor. And so you have 
been doing that for a number of years and you really have a, a sense of America and what we're doing, what we think we're doing, the democratization of the arts in America, that must have been um, a, a really a cultural shock for you to find that anybody could do anything and they said expressing your opinion was art. But do you think it is a healthy thing, actually? Yes, I do think it's healthy. I mean, I, I think we all, everybody in the arts pays lip service all the time to the idea that uh, self-expression is not art. At the same time, you know, exactly who do we want to make the decision about <laughs> which is which? And, you know, I, I don't have any difficulty <laughs> with the democratization of the arts. In some way, I think it's been the great story. In the United States, it's a great story in, in the 20th century. Uh, I think, you know, time looks after the difference between self-expression and art, but there is never a, a strong art without a very rich uh, access and a very rich pool of self-expression. I love that. Time looks after it. Oh, indeed. We will leave it up to time, right? Yes. We don't have to worry about it. I just want to promote this book, Domestic Violence, which has come out in 2007 and now succeeded right on its heels, Collected Poems, 2008. Many of your themes are about marriage and your own children. However, you never intrude upon their privacy. I'm with you on that. Yes, so oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a great, great letter that... Elizabeth Bishop writes to Robert Lowell at one point when, I, I think I'm paraphrasing her, but when he has written somewhat intrusive poems about, about the lives of his wife and his children, she writes to him, <laughs> reproaching him, and says, art just isn't worth that. <laughs> and I think that's right. Oh, I do agree. Yeah. No, art isn't worth one single person's feelings. Please give us another poem, Evan Boland. This poem is called The Emigrant Irish, and... And it really began like sort of unusually in one single remark made to me by my, my husband's mother who came from the west of Ireland and when the electrification schemes came and people got electric light, she told me that everybody took the beautiful oil lamps they had and uh, threw them out. And at a certain point, it seemed to me in Ireland when we were becoming a new burly modern state, we ran a risk of forgetting our past and of those people who left us and went to other shores and really, you know, are, are a powerful part of the ghosts of our Irishness, <laughs> the emigrant Irish. Like oil lamps, we put them out the back of our houses, of our minds. We had lights better than and newer than, and then a time came this time, and now we need them their dread makeshift example. They would have thrived on our necessities. What they survived, we could not even live. By their lights now, it is time to imagine how they stood there, what they stood with, that their possessions may become our power. Cardboard, iron, their hardships parceled in them. Patience, fortitude, long-suffering in the bruise-colored dusk of the new world and all the old songs and nothing to lose. Does Ireland appreciate you? Well, I, I, I would not certainly not think of those as terms. As a diplomat, as an ambassador. Uh, I, I'm not sure that <laughs> Ireland gets itself into that mode. Uh, I mean, it's not <laughs> noted for it. And, but I, uh, I appreciate being Irish. I really do. And I mean, it, I, uh, you know, I've, you know, really, it has been the honor, really, of my life to be an Irish poet. So I think that way round works. Well, um, in domestic violence, there is a wonderful uh, remark. Well, it's a, the first poem on marriage itself. And it seems that you peg your marriage in the geographic sites and times and places, and you use those frames to um, hark back to your own marriage. How do you feel that um, place-shaped relationship? Well, I think, I think you see both, you know, through the other. I mean, Kevin and I met and married and lived as young people in a modest and different Ireland. But mm -hmm. we were both readers and writers, and um, we loved that Ireland. That Ireland now is 
much harder to find than when we were young. There's a different country there. And in many ways, I, I think it's exactly this, the past is another country. And I think, mm. you know, you do, uh, you do eventually get exiled from all of it. And I think your own archive of relationship is a way back to it. And in some ways, it's also irretrievable. You know, I think, what, what poem did you plan to read next? Um, well, there's, a, a, there's one poem here. Uh, which was really the poem from my mother that I wanted to write called Amber. Oh. And um, it really was about a small piece of amber she gave me. And, you know, I, I remembered it and in some ways really wanted to uh, record, you know, the feeling of loss. And amber, of course, that wonderful thing that holds a kind of globe inside itself that goes very far back in time. Amber. It never mattered that there was once a vast grieving. Trees on their hillsides, in their groves, weeping. A plastic gold dropping through seasons and centuries to the ground until now. On this fine September afternoon from which you are absent, I am holding as if my hand could store it, an ornament of amber you once gave me. Reason says this, the dead cannot see the living, the living will never see the dead again. The clear air we need to find each other in is gone forever. Yet this resin once collected seeds, leaves, and even small feathers as it fell and fell, which now in a sunny atmosphere seem as live as they ever were, as though the past could be present and memory itself a Baltic honey, a chafing at the edges of the scene, a showing off of just how much can be kept safe inside a flawed translucence. In rereading your canon um, this week, I thought, you know, she make, gets more going on between a noun and a verb <laughs> than anyone I know. You are able to set up a poem and then just digress and f just float around and then all of a sudden you get to that verb and it is remarkable. I don't even know if you're conscious of how remarkable that is. But I was wondering if you would just take Amber and unravel it for us. Can you remember the moment that you decided to write that poem about Amber? Yes, I, I think most of the moments in which I you know, decide that a poem, you know, is in the works, w would always begin with some kind of opening lines or some kind of way of writing it down. But for a very long time, it wasn't in that shape. It was, you know, more descriptive of Amber or trying to remember Amber or what sort. It was only gradually that it went, you know, got any kind of movement towards, you know, the middle of it where I say, you know, reason says this and you know when you take an object and put it put it next to a reasonable argument and then make the object deny the argument <laughs> then you get some kind of structure for the poem oh but, say that again that is wonderful that's a wonderful well I, th I think in the object that you take like amber and y you will eventually make a proposition in the middle of that poem mm. the dead cannot <laughs> see the living but but you will have the amber on both sides of that to contradict that, that rhetoric. And in some ways, that, that is how you set the poem up, as that inner dialogue between the rhetoric and the image. It, not always, but sometimes. So there's a dramatic action al almost. I, I would think that a, a lyric poet like myself, in some ways a straightforward European lyric poet, has a great interest in drama in the poem, maybe more so than some narrative po poets I know. Because when I talk about between the noun and the verb, I'm talking about a spiral. Yeah. You spiral, which is the psychological action going on in the poem. And how many drafts do you think you uh, had to achieve for Amber? Or don't you know? Me, it, it certainly took me seven or eight months. And it, but it wasn't drafted all the time mm -hmm. in that. It was put aside and taken out again. I mean, William Trevor, the Irish writer, once said, you know, that he put away his short stories as 
a writer till he could take them out as a reader ah. and however long that took and for me it was a matter of just putting it away when I got stuck and taking it out and trying to you know get it unstuck and eventually it, it got unstuck. You've written some wonderful poems to your mother in domestic violence. I think everyone would want to read them. Um, when do you return to Ireland? I go back every 10 weeks. Oh, you do? Every 10 weeks. So um, is it a year long? Uh, well, I'm at tenure? Stanford for three quarters of the year, but it's a quarter system, not a semester system. So after 10 weeks, I, get, I suppose it's about 30 weeks at Stanford and 22 in Ireland. Where do you do your writing? Well, always, almost always, whenever I have a morning somewhere, which is going to happen every 24 hours, so I mean, I, I, I have never found it too difficult. No. If you've ever had a child, yes. you can do anything with standing on one foot. Yeah. That's the prerequisite for sure. being a writer. <laughs> sure. <laughs> right? And it, it was probably easier now than when they were little, when your Very, daughters were yes, little. Yes, when I had two children under the age of four. But you did it. Four. I did it, but in, in a pretty uh, haphazard way. Well, who didn't? I know. The um, hopes that we have are that we can rarefy our work as I've seen you do over the years, and get clearer and more precise and more pristine and more sure and more certain of your voice. What, what is it you want next from your poetry? Well, I think, you know, despite the, the myth, poets don't improve. I mean, they're not, <laughs> they're not, you know, bottles of wine or something. That's an old romantic myth. I think you write poems when you're younger that you can never write when you're older, and you write poems when you're older that you couldn't have written when you were young. The point is to find which those are. Those and, are good. You know, which, which way to go. And Maya Angelou says, every time you sit down at the paper, you don't know how to do it. No, yeah, absolutely. Every day that you sit down at absolutely. the paper. So I think that that is um, well said. But I don't know if it's age, but the poems that are in the newest books have so much space and light around them and in your collected new collected poems as well is that um norton yes put it that yes. out okay evan boland we thank you so much for coming to visit us today we love talking to you well, thank you for having me please come back our conversation has been with evan boland ireland's most popular poet and very beloved in america this is the writing life i'm grace cavalieri Thank you.